This is off planet radio. Hey everybody, welcome to Off Planet Radio, Off Planet TV. I'm Randy Moggins. Will you please stop laughing at me? I'm not doing take three. You're getting it live now. Hey, right. we're, we're here. Emily's with me. She's trying to screw up my intro. And so I'm not doing one. Emily, what's going on? Hi, guys. Uh, welcome back. Um, just before we get started, I want to uh, shout out to our, patron, pat- uh, our patrons at, over at Patreon. Um, we are loving this. We are having awesome group chats. Just for, so everyone knows we are now doing two group chats a month, one on a directed topic and one just kind of free flow. So um, if you haven't joined us over at patreon.com forward slash off planet media yet, please do. We are doing some really cool stuff over there. And uh, let's see. So tonight uh, we have a good show for you. We have lots of stuff to rip through. And uh, our, we have our favorite ripper here to, to do that with us. He is the... Uh, Mr. Hognitive Dissonance himself, the third amigo of this team. <laughs> Mr. 15 Minutes of Flame, Robert Phoenix, welcome black. Uh, welcome black. Welcome back hey. off, off Planet Radio. <laughs> back in black. Back, well, back in black. About yeah. as black as you can get, right? I'm black well, on the yeah. inside. Don't let this fool you. <laughs> Boy. Um, hey, it's, it's great to be back and uh, with, with you two. And, uh, you know, going to crack some things open tonight. Because we are in, we are in the cyclotron right now. That we certainly are. So, um, all right. So I know we wanted to talk about some uh, astrological sort of themes that are upcoming. Um, do, you want, do we want to start there, or let's just sort of hop in wherever you want to, and we'll go wherever the conversation takes us. Yeah, I, th- I think the big uh, the big news of the universe is that we've had a major shift with uh, Chiron. Uh, which took place on the 17th of April. And it's really interesting watching these shifts occur and then seeing events in the outside world begin to kind of morph and conform to what's going on with Chiron. And and because Chiron has moved into Aries, it went from Chiron and Pisces and was there for, you know, fair amount of time and seemed like it was a lot longer than um it really was there but uh now it's in now it's in aries we got chiron and aries and the shift is is pretty dramatic um just setting the stage chiron and pisces i mean what did we have for the last three and a half to four years i mean you know really if you, if we look at what happened with say um boston and the boston marathon and you know kind of boston strong and all these events that you know, hashtag strong. These are all indicative in a lot of ways of Chiron and Pisces wow. because we're talking about suffering, excuse me, victimization, wounding. It's where the wounded becomes the hero. The sufferer becomes the hero. Do you remember that, uh, that shooting up in uh, Clackamas County at the uh, community college? The, the, uh, um, Qua- no, no. What was <laughs> um, the, um, um, Qua- community um, college? Yeah. Right. And so you had, you know, the guy who was, the army guy there on the college who was quote unquote the hero. What did we see? We didn't see him really doing anything, but we saw him in his hospital room with some very dubious uh, tubing and, uh, you know, connected to him. Right. But that's kind of what, you know, what we've been going through and passing through is, you know, the victim as the hero with Chiron and Pisces. And we've come to that. We've come to an end for now. Chiron's going to go retrograde later this year for one more, cycle we get one more swipe at this you know kind of phenomenon where the victim and victim culture you know became celebrated almost almost like a you know a mass sort of i don't know kind of a mass crucifixion or something you know in very piscean kinds of of terminology and symbolism so some interesting things have happened since then culturally slash socially number one is we're seeing this interesting dance going on with Korea. And I found this to be really, really fascinating because 
Chiron, which is a, a planetoid, is basically, it doesn't really strike the middle between Saturn and Uranus, but to the one side of Chiron is Uranus, to the other side of Chiron is Saturn. And it's part of this, you know, it's kind of like an asteroid belt. They call them the, uh, the centaurs. And a lot of these, you know, giant like space rocks get sucked into Saturn's orbit. And they become moons. So I think Chiron is like the third biggest of these space rocks. And it actually has an orbit, right? So we've been tracking Chiron in earnest since 1977. And as an astrological cipher, it's gained more and more popularity and more and more interest because people are trying to figure themselves out. What's wrong? Where am I hurt? Where am I wounded? How can I fix something? And then ultimately, you know, we got a whole planet full of healers. So they're interested, right, in the wounded healer. How does that affect me? Do I have healing powers? Where are they? So it's kind of risen in prominence. And one of the interesting pieces around Chiron, there are many, but the, one of the main ones is that you have Saturn on one side, which is discipline, structure, form, and order, right? It is doing the right thing, getting the right job, marrying the right person, you know, keep, keeping everything in line, going to the gym, working out, all that stuff. You bow, you bow at the temple of Saturn, and guess what? You get rewarded, you move along, and all's well and good, right? And then the other side, you have Uranus, which is disruptive, rebellious, creative, dangerous, revolutionary. So Chiron is straddling both of these polarities, right? And so we do a dance with both of them throughout our lives, and Chiron is representative in our charts of where we do that dance. So what's been really interesting is watching what's been happening with South Korea and North Korea as kind of a model for Chiron and this movement from Chiron and Pisces to Chiron and Aries, okay? And if you look at North and South Korea, it almost perfectly models this dynamic of Chiron. You look at South Korea, and South Korea is very Saturnian. You know, it's like, hey, let's play ball. You know, let's make stuff. Let's make a lot of money. You know, we'll be buddy-buddy with the United States. You know, structure, form, and order. You know, we'll, you know we'll, this is what we'll throw down with. And that's what they did, right? They became industrialists. And then if you go to North Korea, you know, you have the Iranian side. They're communists. They break away. They're radical. They fire missiles. They become involved in all kinds of international events. Well, Kim, Kim Jong-un's father did, for sure. I mean, he was an international shit disturber. Um, maybe not on a grand scale, but he would, you know, show up in places like Africa and throw down with the Chinese and the Russians. And they wanted to overthrow somebody. You know, he would supply some stuff. So, um, so we have these two models, right? We have North Korea, which is Uranian. And then we have South Korea, which is Saturnian. And what are they doing now? Well, first of all, they're agreeing that the war is over, right? They're going to end the war. So that means that whether or not uh, Donald Trump or Pompeo, whomever, you know, ride in, you know, on a white stallion and, and sew this thing up, which they've been back channeling for a while now, what we're seeing is this really interesting uni unification between one country that has been bifurcated by this chirotic kind of division. I think it's really, really interesting. And part of the reason why we got here was because Kim Jong-un is, you know, firing Elon Musk's missiles, right? I mean, that's what he was doing. And so that's, you know, warlike, it's Aries-like. And between, right, between everything, you've got the United States, this big body of water. And so we have, you know, the Piscean effect, right, which is Chiron and Pisces. And what happened, you know, not long ago, we had that weird, like, um, you know, uh, emergency alert drill in Hawaii, you know, again, over the water, Chiron and Pisces, what happened? Did somebody fire a missile? Who fired a missile? With Pisces, we don't get a lot of answers. There's a lot of speculation, which is why we're having a hard time getting to things like the truth with Neptune and Pisces. Good luck on that, right? Good luck. So, but it's really fascinating watching this thing happen with this do, country. Do we so have a, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Do we have a long cycle that's maybe culminating here in this Korean thing? As I'm sitting here listening to you talk, my whole life, this North Korea, South Korea conflict, 
is played as a backdrop, much like the Cold War thing that, that, that happened during our, our youth. My father served in the Navy in the Korean War. And it, it's, it's felt to me like there was always something about the Korean War. You, you, you have the movie and the TV series MASH, which was a huge hit in the 60s, which was sort of an overlay of the Vietnam War. And the Vietnam War was kind of the, the catalyst for the escalation of international intrigues that have gone on since World War II. So my question is, is there a cycle here that's resolving? Are we seeing the end of a cycle? A very well, long I would, cycle? Yeah, I, I would say so. And what, what's really interesting, Randy, um, with, the, with the MASH reference, um, it, it, it was like, because, you know, it was, a, it was a hit movie with Robert Altman. And, you know, it was based on a book. And then they brought it to, you, to TV. And MASH was almost like this comedic come down from the Vietnam War, right? I mean, it was got the tail end of the Vietnam War. Uh, it, it, you know, p you know, the vets were home. You know, we, we were having this kind of war hangover, and there's MASH on TV, and um, you know, so it was like this comedic come down. Now, in terms of uh, uh, Korea and the cycles of Korea, well, it's an interesting question uh, because in 1950, this is really when you know, North Korea finally becomes its own entity. And just a quick glance um, at that time, we had Jupiter and Aquarius. And Aquarius, of course, <clears throat> the ruler of Aquarius is Uranus. So again, we're going to have that Uranian um, chirotic discussion. But also, um, the true node was in Aries at that time. And here we go. We have Chiron coming into Aries. And so perhaps there could be a really interesting sync with the end of the cycle with, you know, transiting Chiron and Aries conjuncting the true node in Aries, which was around during that time. Now, the true node moves, um, moves backwards. So the next stop for the true node uh, would be Pisces. And that would have, been, that would have taken place uh, roughly in the summer, summer, fall of, and I'm just riffing on this right now. So it looks like it's the, you know, August of, of 1950. But that period of, unit of you know, the Korean bifurcation was already, you know, well in place by 1945 and culminating, right. you know, in uh, 1950. So um, I would say the answer to your question is, is likely yes. And I would certainly base it on, you know, what was going on with the, the true node at that time. Um, so, yeah, I think, I think we are reaching the end of that cycle. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's actually optimistic on a personal level as well as I think. Well, it, you know, I think these guys like to keep their, their little fires, you know, burning, right? They like to keep them burning. They just like to keep stuff happening so that if they need to go and tend to the fire, make it hotter, they can do that. You know, and, I, and, and I've been, you know, dosing on a lot of Anthony Sutton again, who I think is yeah. probably one of the most important thinkers in the last 100 years. And I can't stress enough, you know, if people have not really spent time to read his books or listen to his recordings, you, you just got to get there. And one of the things that he talks about uh, and has done really, really a granular research on is how the United States has been involved in propping up everything from the Nazis to the Soviets and even the North Koreans. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for whatever reason, you know, and there are various reasons, there are a number of reasons. And, um, you know, so... Again, from the internationalist perspective, it's probably looking like North Korea might have outlived its usefulness. Mm -hmm. And I think that they're ready to move on so that they can concentrate more than likely on what's happening in the Middle East. That's my, that's my take. Cool. Like, I don't think they can fight three wars. Like, you know, they can't have, they can't, they can't have three, like, fronts of war. They can't go after North Korea. They can't, like, have their dirty little game in Syria. You know, they, they can't go after Iran. Now they're building, you know, a, a big, you know, drone base in Niger. You know, there's just so much going on out there. And I, and I think that they have to limit their, you know, where their fronts are. And they may bring North Korea in as um, another kind of, you know, post-martial plan 
industrial partner. And that'll be interesting to, to, to watch and see what happens and how the South Koreans actually feel about it, you know. And it may, may be, you know, the uh, potential co-project between the United States, you know, Samsung, some of these uh, LG, some of these companies, you know, actually moving into North Korea. That could be very interesting. And I think it, it talks and speaks to this, this healing of Chiron which is clearly and distinctly between, you know, North and South Korea. I mean, we really don't. Know. You're like, like, look, we have, since World War II, we have persisted in cycles of basically second world industrial nations that have been our primary pool of, of cheap labor. We went through it post-World War II with Japan. By the 70s, early 80s, Japan was a spent force because economically, it couldn't sustain an industrial base of that size with the resources that they had at hand, plus the fact that they were not cost efficient anymore. They were too affluent. Go to China, the same thing. We're seeing China now reaching a critical mass right. where their own affluency is a choke point for our continued industrial expansionism. So doesn't it feel like North Korea is a likely suspect now to bring in as an ally to continue that, that foreign labor market pool industrial base? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. De definitely. I mean, they're, you know, they're, they're a, an untapped kind of human resource in a lot of ways. And, um, you know, there, there are basically two North Koreas. There's the Pyongyang, North Korea, and then there's everything outside of North Korea, which is pretty brutal and pretty spare. And a lot of people who are malnourished and, you know, are basically subsisting off at times whatever they can find. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what happens and, and, you know, sort of the tidal shift that can take place. And hopefully, hopefully it will take place because, you know, obviously they could cook up another headache somewhere else, but it would be kind of one less thing for us to people to stew over in the evening news. And again, you know, it's a really rare situation. I mean, we don't have countries, I can't think of too many countries now where there's a clear north-south and a division between the people of those countries. So this is a very specific and very unique kind of circumstance. And again, I think it's a manifestation of Chiron. Another manifestation of this Chiron and Aries piece is this movie, um, A Quiet Place, which I was talking about the other night. Have you guys like checked out a quiet place yet? I, nope. I've, I, I never, I never watch movies. It's worth seeing. Okay. It's really, it's really worth seeing. It's, you know, um, is it in theaters or, or is it on Netflix or where can we see no, it? No, it's in theaters and okay. it's got, got like a 98% positivity rate on rotten tomatoes. Okay. It's almost 90. It's really John Krasinski from the office. Oh, I did hear you talking about this the other night. Okay. Yeah, yeah. He, he's in it and he directs it. And he's, he, his wife, Emily Blunt, I did not know they were married, is also in it. And he's great. It, and it breaks the mold of kind of this dystopic, post apocalyptic world. You know, if, you know, I contrasted it with The Road, which is a very heavy flick. And, um, you know, that's bleak, it's dark, there are cannibals running around. and. And it's a guy, a father and a son just trying to get through and to make some very heavy decisions at certain points. This film, and the road is like grays and browns and blacks. It's very monochromatic. This film is filled with color. You know, there's corn growing in the fields. Um, they live in a compound where there's lantern tea lights all over the place. You know, they sit around and they have dinner with candlelight. It's a very unusual mix of something that is profound and celebratory, but at the same time, there is terror and danger lurking everywhere. It's a fascinating kind of portrayal of the world where there's a lot less people. And, and, and I think, that, you know, with cinemas, a lot, of, a lot of times with cinema, obviously it's planned, it's programmed. We know the story, right? We're going to roll these films out. You know, we're going to get people to think in this way. We're going to reorient their psychology, identity, sex, whatever. But there are times and there are movies that do feel as though they're kind of archetypal and they kind of emerge from some other place. And this is one of them because it has a very different feel than anything 
that's happening in Hollywood. Completely different. And it gives us a very different version of this potential future. Now, there's some interesting subtext to the movie, which I don't really want to get into. But I want to touch on is the chirotic aspect. Because the movie was released on April 6th, which is during the final degrees of Chiron and Pisces. And there is a scene in the movie where um, Emily Blunt, now just keep in mind, one of the things that's very important with this world is you can't say anything. That's why they call it a quiet place, because there are these aliens who have, they're blind, but they have incredible hearing. Mm -hmm. so, so the slightest noise, they're all over something. And so they've got to be extremely quiet. And Emily Blunt in this film is pregnant, so she's going to have a kid. They have to figure out how they're going to do this thing, right? So there's a scene in the movie, and um, you know, I don't want to really give too much away, but she's going downstairs to, me. Bless you, to, to basically get involved in this process with having her kid, and she steps on a nail, like hard, and she can't say anything, right? Oh. So she, you know, immediately there's this, like you are going through the silent scream inside of yourself. It's really powerful. And what's interesting is that the soul of the foot is representative of Pisces. You know, Pisces rules ah. the soul of the feet. And here we have the wounded soul, right? Ah. The, the wounded heel, the wounded healer. It's yeah. right there in the film. Yeah. It's like, holy smokes, this is incredible. You know, and, and it happens to a woman, and I've talked about kind of the feminine effect with Chiron and Aries, um, which I don't really want to get into, but it's all positive. It's all good. And, and then what happens next is that there's a lot of water that begins to come into this subterranean space. Okay. So now we have the water element. And then the final scene of the movie, I don't want to give it away, but I will tell you if you are smart and sharp and you go to the film and you remember this conversation, you will understand that Chiron and Aries is being introduced. And I'm not going to say any more, but it's brilliant. So that, you know, that's a major marker astrologically for this movie. And then I guess the third marker, which we were talking about and kind of like, you know, making fun of in a weird way was what happened up in Ontario in Canada just recently with this guy taking, you know, the white van and running down with nine people. And apparently, He's he his this this guy's like inspiration was Elliot Roger, who was the kid who, you know, theoretically, and I spent a lot of time looking at that Santa Barbara thing, and it stinks, just like all these other events do. And um he they so there's a group of men who look at Elliot Roger as like a hero because he was so pissed off that he wasn't getting laid that he decided to take people out as a statement. So there's, there's a group of men, and they're called incels. And we were, we were talking about this earlier, and they're, they're involuntary celibates, and they're blaming feminism for not being able to, you know, hook up. So, again, this is a kind of a Chiron and Aries moment. I mean, what are we talking about? Whether it's real or, or not, whether it's like some kind of stage, of, who knows, right? But you look at it from this, kind of, you know, place of astro mysticism or astro sinks. And you have a wounded man, right? Aries is the wounded man. And he's not in touch with his what? He's not in touch with his phallus, right? He's not, he, there's, he, he's disempowered. And so what is he doing? He's going to get a big truck <laughs> and go kill somebody. We, we was are, it, was, we're was clearly. It, was it a Dodge Ram? Right yeah. Probably Dodge Ram. You there you go. need to get in touch with your phallus. <laughs> really do. Yeah, so Dodge this, is, Ram. Yeah, this okay. is Chiron and Aries, right? This is the wounded male. So yeah. we're in it now. This is going to be so fascinating and how this, you know, be, how this manifests. And in a myriad of different ways. And of course, there's the gun thing, which is also part of Chiron and Aries. We had another shooter, Travis Ranking. Don't you love that last name? Ranking! Of course, of course. <laughs> Travis Ranking! We're going to put a good Nazi spin on this. Yes! Heil Hitler, right? I'm coming right. to the Waffle House to kill you! 
you know, the whole thing was weird, right? Yeah. And have you seen the look on his face? I haven't actually haven't watched any coverage or any videos or anything about it. I've only heard you talk about it. I haven't. He looks. He, he's got the same look as uh, Nicholas Cruz, nice. like like the yeah. who the fuck like who the fuck am I look? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like the well, nobody all, home. All of the shooters look. either look like nobody's home or they look like a CGI creation. Like Adam. Absolutely. Lanza, like Adam Lanza, the YouTube shooter. Um, on, on a certain level, that like Jared Lee Loughner, these people all look like they were like digitally arranged and animated and then the other people like nicholas cruz and you know if you're talking i i, I haven't seen this guy so i can't speak for him. but nicholas cruz or like um james holmes they just look like yeah not but only james are, holmes didn't even look the same from the same person yeah. no he doesn't even look like the same person, no, person I mean, yeah but the, this this um same the other one who totally doesn't look like the same person is the joe car sarnayev right the kid that they were looking for and the kid that 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 you know that the kid that apparently is Joe Carson and I have, and the kid that they ended up finding the two and that was in the courtroom looked nothing alike. You know, I have not, right. I have not seen that, but it doesn't surprise me. Nothing the, like the, the, the kid who was, so if you look at the Joe, the picture of Joe Carson and I have, that was on the cover of Rolling Stone magazine, that is the, the one who like, that's sort of the real one or whatever, I guess. Like he's a good looking guy. The one that they were showing in some of the surveillance videos and then who showed up in the courtroom has a completely different face and is not attractive. Um, but it, they're completely different people. Like, there's not even, like, I don't even understand how anyone could ever believe they're the same person. Same with the James Holmes things. But, like, it's always either that. It's not the same person. The person looks like they're not home, or it looks like a digitally arranged image of the person. And we never see that, those people. We never saw an Adam Lanza in court, or, you know what I mean? Because he's dead, right? We're never going to see this uh, it, girl from the YouTube shooting in court because she's dead. You know what I mean? So, like, it's, that whole what? YouTube shooting thing is going dead cold, silent, blank slate, nothing, nothing. It is radio silence right now on that. Yeah, the whole thing is, is really weird. It's very I mean, bizarre. <clears throat> it, it almost feels like there's almost like two versions of shootings that take place. There are the shootings that the left will pounce on because they're left friendly. And then there are other shootings that the left won't touch. And maybe it's because... Mm -hmm. They're not involved, right? Um, so it's like, oh, we didn't do that one, so we're not going to capitalize on that one, you know. But we were kind of involved in this one, so we're gonna, you know, we're gonna dry, we're gonna dry. I mean, you're right. It's just, it's well, cold, it's, it's like there's two kinds of shootings, and then even within the shootings or the events or whatever, it's like there's two versions within them. Like I've talked about this once before in the show. I think one time we had Crow on, but when the Boston bombing happened. Like, I, for some reason, that one was far more fascinating to me than Sandy Hook or a lot of, like, it's weird. The ones that catch my interest are usually not the ones that are as popular as some of the other ones. But the Boston bombing one was interesting to me. I came upon some interesting stuff on a message board or chat room kind of thing where the person was describing that these agencies who do these events use a technique called shadows and echoes, which is where they stage the event two ways. So that there's like, so... They have one thing that's a total setup where everything is completely choreographed and staged. And then a few blocks away, they'll have another version of it where there will, there will be some liveness to it. Like, right, right, some people who are involved don't know what's going on. And right. they use the events to basically, like, they'll take video clips from each one to kind of arrange the way that they want the public to see it, right? And this goes not only for what happened at the bombing, right? Remember, there was two bombing locations. So, like, that's sort of the evidence that that could happen. And apparently, one, there was some degree of spontaneity to it, even though it was still fake. And the other one was completely controlled and contrived. But even as far as um, when they, the night when they, Ran, ran over the other Sarnayev brother, right? There was this weird stuff where like some people were describing one scene, but then on the video, it looked like they had him there and he was naked, right? They had two scenes of that. And then same thing when it came to the boat shooting. This was describing how like there was one boat shoot, shoot one, one boat catching the guy, you know, shootout staged in one, like one area and one, another one a few blocks away and different things happening in each one so that they could sort of splice them together the same way you would like edit stuff together uh, for, you know, a DJ mix or for a video editing, right? Like, like literally two separate events and one is the shadow and one is the echo, right? And well, it makes total sense. It was fascinating. But I, so I think we have these different kinds of shootings and then within the shootings, different areas of control over it. And it's kind of, you know, how they, I think some of it, they wait and see how it goes to see which end they're going to play up. I think this, the, I think the YouTube shooting fell flat because I think what they were really like, you know, 
they were hoping that we would all get really reactive to it because they were trying to use it to prove that anybody who says that YouTube suppresses their videos is crazy, right? That's what, that was the whole point. And I think all of us were sort of wise enough to not be reactive and, you know, we just, the shooting didn't really get covered that much in the alternative media. So their ability to sort of tie us all together into that was limited by the fact that we didn't react. Yeah, and yes, and also the the person. So weird. You know, I mean. Yeah, what was that all about? Did Were they trying to so spin weird. this into like a transgender thing as well? It, cer it certainly felt that way. That's what right. Like. Because what was really interesting about that shooting is that, and I was like kind of really tracking it, and uh, there was a, like, a, like a news bulletin it was it was all over the internet that a transgender actually did the shooting yeah yeah mm -hmm. right and then it was a, a prank right it was a prank it was like you know and everybody had to pull their shit and you know somebody from 4chan pulled a big prank but it turns out that quite possibly whether it was a cgi or who knows what i mean there's a good chance that this person might have had what marfan's disease or could have been a trans i mean the whole thing is just bizarre Right. And, it kind of, and it feeds into kind of where we are right now. Or it could be yeah, what we yeah. talked about. There could literally have been two places the shooting was staged. And one, there was sort of this female whatever character and another a sort of transgender lookalike kind of thing, right? Like having two different people playing the same role at the two different spots. And so some people, so it was getting reported one way and the other way. You know what I mean? I think that's sort of, um, I mean, especially just, I mean, if you listen to, sometimes when you listen to the descriptions of these events, they sound totally different from the two different people describing it. You know Absolutely. I mean? Well, you know, again, one of the early snippets from that event was people, you know, talking about guys in body armor, mm -hmm, you know, in, in side you arms, know. right? So, yeah. I mean, that was one of the first things that came out of that. Um, yeah, again, just, just more high strange for our time. And like, what's real, what's not real. I, I think it's going to get worse. Man, and her videos were so weird. This is totally weird. It was so weird. It just like, and there was a CGI quality to her, like, like oh, almost absolutely. in the same way there's a CGI quality to Edward Snowden, where they're yeah. almost like translucent. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like on a certain way, level, and the way that they move is, it does seem like pixelated a little bit. Like there was that one. Somebody made a video. Somebody who wasn't even a conspiracy theorist made a video about how strangely her body was moving in those exercise videos. Like, and it was weird. It was like almost like moving in like block frame. You know what I mean? Like it was kind of strange. Um, yeah, it was. It was. It was almost like. Um, um, what was that? What was that TV show back in the uh, '80s? What was it? Oh God, Max Headroom. It was almost had like a yeah, Max yeah, Headroom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My favorite TV show, by the way. It was great. Yeah. Max Headroom was amazing. Yeah. Was no, so we're living weird. in that time now. Absolutely. I mean, Max Headroom was prophetic. Yeah. In terms of the way they staged a dystopian society controlled by a media corporate conglomerate. Yep. You know, just wrap your mind around that. Think Google. That's think where we are. YouTube. Yeah. Well, that's exactly where we are. Yep. It's a Absolutely. slightly different spin. It's not quite TV the way we thought TV was going to be. But in 1984, the computer didn't look like that either. It was, it was a static box that was basically running DOS or some version of, you know, Apple. Now it is the TV for all intents and purposes. TVs are computers, computers are TVs, phones are TVs. The whole freaking planet is one gigantic plasma screen. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, absolutely. And events, people can be inserted, deleted. I mean, you yeah. know, I mean, the, the, the whole notion that we're living in a matrix, whether it's, you know, a, um, a simulation from the inside out doesn't really matter because now it's really becoming that, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, yeah. Randy's absolutely right. I mean, the whole planet has become the screen. Uh, yeah, the sky, well, the sky is the big, the sky is like the um, going to the drive-in movies now, right? Like that's like, you well, know, you don't have to drive up to the screen anymore. It's just- You gotta right understand that the, the hypnotic effect is rather seamless at this point because we aren't, in a position to judge reality the way it's portrayed in a perceptual manner because everything is digitized on one level. Our music's digitized, 
our media is digitized, our money is rapidly becoming digitized. Yeah. So we're kind of in this place where we're pixels in play and are- Well, and they're trying to digitize us. Well, of course they are. That's yeah. exactly what all this data mining is about. Yeah. You know, it's a simulacrum on, on one level in process. And so our perceptual abilities are now being shunted into this digital world in a way that reality perception itself in the digital era is, is becoming very difficult to separate from the real flesh and bone beings that are, that are both consuming and being part of this. We're not only consuming media, we are media on yeah. one level or another, even if it's just your Facebook page. Right. Yeah. Look at what we're doing right now. Right. Exactly. I mean, yeah. And there are hundreds of thousands of other people, you know, doing the same thing we're doing, which is a, a radical shift from, you know, 30 years ago where people weren't doing this. Well, no, Not we've even, reversed that, the equation on the media in one sense. Yeah. They are being yeah. eclipsed and they're very aware of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, the other thing that you, I think we should add into the mix is also this whole notion of identity and language mm. around identity. Totally. Good stuff. Good yeah. stuff. Yeah. You know, because you know, I, was, I, big, I went to a, a website, which is basically a kind of, there, so, okay. Somebody sent me a link to this YouTube video of a former teacher <laughs> in Austin. And she resigned from being a teacher because she saw what was happening in terms of sex ed, the, the transgender transformation, starting at, you know, K and moving up. And, you know, she saw what was going on. And there, there is, and she, it's like somebody who came, like the spy who came from, in from the polls. And she's got names, she's got programs, she's got organizations. And it's really fascinating to watch this really strategic and concerted effort to get into the heads of kids at about age five now. Mm -hmm. And to really, you know, fuck with their identity. Um, and it's, it, it, to me, it, I think it's a crime against humanity. Mm -hmm. um, and partially because at that age, kids don't need 30 options about who they can become, who they can be. They just don't need it. They need one or two really solid options, right? And anchor into something. I know it sounds really provincial, but well, that's my, my point of view. Also, what about just being themselves? What about just being Emily or just being Robert and not having to have some other identifier or whatever? At five years old, it's just like, you know, and, and actually always, like I'm t sick and tired of all of this identity shit and all of the language that goes with that, along with it. I, I'm, I'm compl I completely am in rejection of all of that shit right now. I am just me, you know what I mean? Like, and, and that is it, whatever. But I, I think you're at a point where you can make an informed choice about that. Like you, you know, you can sift through things. Kids, I mean, I get where you're coming from and I agree with you, right? But if, you know, and there generally tends to be a natural inclinations yeah. between the sexes. One group will do this and another group will do that, unless for the most part, not always. Right. Not, not, not generalizing, right? But then what happens is, is like all of a sudden they start to get programming and it's like, wow, you know, you can do this and you can do this and you can be this. And next thing you know, you got a really confused kid. Right. And, and, and by the time, and she pointed this out, by the time they get to the age of 10, and this is in, uh, in I, A, A, S, U, D, whatever it's called, A, S, U, I, D. Yeah. Um, Ten-year-old kids are learning about things like, you know, masturbation and anal sex, and yep. she she put up some of the teaching tools. Well, they yeah. le they learned from the Dare program that you can create a, a generation of drug addicts by teaching them about drug resistance, and the same thing is happening here, right? Like they're using like they're they're using the guise of like sex education and health education and stuff like that right. to create right. the Absolutely. scenario that they want going forward. Absolutely. So now I'm just giving you sort of the backstory because I went to one of these websites and checked it out. And there is a guy on the website, like they have these profiles of people. I forget what the uh, website is. I had it up here. Like, I think I lost. But anyway, he was talking about how cool it is to not be anything. 
right? Like, I don't have to be a man. I don't have to be a woman. I don't have to be an American. You know, I, can, I, don't, I don't have to, you know, um, mm -hmm. address borders. And in some ways, I think this is actually not a bad thing. Right, right? exactly. I, I, agree. Think it's, yeah. I think it's fine, you know, because on some level, that is the, I think that's right. where I think we'd all like to aspire towards, right? However, the model that they're using to get there is, I think, a disingenuous shortcut. And, and, it's, and it's based on, to some degree, what I'd call spiritual laziness. That's just my opinion, okay? Um, but, and I think we all want to get to that point. But, but it's an engineered model, and yeah. it's setting everything up so that we all move into this, you know, whatever, whatever version of the new well, world. Ultimately, ultimately the right. way this rolls is that it is malleable material for social engineering. Yeah. What they're doing is they're creating a blank canvas. They've scrubbed the model. There is gender identification. There is identities that are forming in a child at that age. And quite honestly, we all know this. Some express strongly in certain aspects one way or another, whether it's consistent with their birth sex or whatever. There is that variation. It's unusual. But now they're standardizing that and they're blurring the whole screen so that as they bring them through, they have the ability to then introduce concepts that I don't even think are acceptable for, acceptable for adults. First off, it's a model to basically do pharmaceutical intervention, surgical intervention, yep. psychological intervention. Yeah. You see, the problem isn't that somebody's making a choice. The problem is this is, this is human flesh's programmable matter. Yeah. This is the morphogenic field being reprogrammed in real time to create third, fourth, fifth, and sixth sexes as options to beings that have not even barely been acquainted with their own soul yet walking around animate in this world. That's, a, That's what's wrong absolute, with it. It's a great point. And, you know, and I did a, did a show a couple of weeks ago, uh, you know, and I called it the trans economy. Yeah, and, mm -hmm. that was great. That was great. It was a great show, yeah. And essentially, you know, what's taking place is the creation of a basically a customer base for life, right? Because once you opt into these procedures, yeah. you're opt in forever. Exactly. This is just yeah. another, this, uh, the, everything with this transgender or gender fluidity or whatever this agenda is, is a, a stepping stone or like a training wheels program for the transhumanist economy, which is also going to require constant upgrades, cr constant, you know, uh, new, like, just like you have to upgrade your phone all the time. You're going to need the latest chip, the newest stat, the newest, you know what I mean? Uh, there's going to be, um, chemicals to put in your body there's going to be adjustments well, to be it's going towards it's going towards altered carbon basically yeah. it'll go to the place where they go you know what screw it you don't really need a body let's upload the consciousness haha -ha, like you can really do that right we'll put you into storage and we'll give you whatever sleeve you want well now all of a sudden you don't even have to choose you're kind of like gosh i feel like a woman today you know and it's yeah. like ta-da new sleeve Right. That's, right. And it's, a, it's an ultra consumerist approach to things that are highly existential and, and, and esoteric in a sense. I mean, the, the ideal of the hermaphrodite is a very esoteric field that people have studied for a long time, good, bad, or indifferent. But this takes it to a whole other level because now it's a product that can be sold too. Well, also, it does, and since you brought up language with identity like one of the things i really like um that my friend danny who's really into the whole you know use of language for, for yeah, danny you know, katz yeah danny katz she talks about like that all of this stuff happening like makes people not like like it would be much better for us to she, like she says like transcend in, like, transcend like transcend and include rather than cut off Right. So like the, I, I think this sort of like ability to just change the outside of somebody's but one's of one's body or take some chemicals to do all that, like it's retards the opportunity for a spiritual growth that happens when you live in the vessel that you were that you when you, you know, 
become who you are in the vessel that you're in without having to change it, right? Like, I just feel like it's kind of like, it's, on a certain level, it's spiritual laziness, right? Like That's exactly what I was all yeah, of getting these, at. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's also these. trapping you in the physical form. Yeah. Whereas transcendence is the opposite of that. Transcendence yes. is the recognition of the spiritual state and the temporary existence in, 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 in a physical form. We're reversing right. the equation now. Yeah, yeah. Like we're changing. It change, and the whole thing to me just feels like, you know, it's, it's, a, it's actually a way to homogenize, right? Like, so what? So you're a girly boy, be a girly boy. Don't change your body to become a girl. Like, be that. Like, whatever it is. If you, you know what I mean? Like, look at someone like David Bowie, right? He was able to do all this stuff that he wanted to do within himself, but he didn't actually go around altering his body and taking stuff and whatever, right? Like, you know, and that's an, sort of an extreme example of someone, you know, who's very flamboyant and whatever. But just, you know, what about like, the whatever lesson or whatever whatever this earth experience earth human experience is for to me it feels like it's for whatever becoming what you want to become in this package you came in you know what i mean not like you know just altering all this stuff on the outside which then actually doesn't what doesn't was it uh, our friends um danny mckinney and we have that facebook we have that facebook group that we all chat on what well, we're talking about a um, today. Well, it came up in the last few days, but it's basically um, a reduction in second law of thermodynamics, entropy, an entropy reduction machine for the training of the soul. Did, does this? I did. I somehow fair? missed that. Okay, part this was that, yeah. the video that was posted there, and I'm sorry. Yeah. For listeners, I'm leaving you kind of clueless here, but the whole concept of the video that got posted there, and maybe I can find it, I can throw the link out. It w was basically this place as an entropy reduction training machine for the soul. In other words, we're in this physical state as a transitional, mm -hmm. and it is essentially kind of a playground, I guess, in terms of the soul going through what it needs to work out in the incarnation. That's, yeah. that's a long and short of it. And I, I f there's a part of me that feels like you got to work it, you got to work it out yeah. sort of with what she came in with. Oh, yeah. absolutely. I mean, I, that's, I mean, cause I think if we are really honest with ourselves, everybody, right. At some point in time, we've questioned who we are. Well, gee, I mean, am I a manly man? Am I a womanly woman? Right. We all kind of have those little dialogues, right. And at yeah. some point, we're like, you know what? I'm in this body, and I'm going to be a guy because this is what I signed up for yep. in this lifetime. I'm going to learn what it's about, for better or worse. You know, mm -hmm. I'll be I'll be an asshole. And I'll you know I'll punch the asshole part or whatever, <laughs> right? And th then I'll learn my lessons, and and that's part of I think being in this physical body, what you signed up for. You know, getting back to Bowie for just a second, I think this is a really he's really interesting because. He is really the model for fluidity, right? Exactly. I mean, exactly. he's like the thin white duke. He's a Latin saint. Yeah. Uh, he has his Berlin face. At one point, you know, he's very hip to the fact, and this is, this is right around the time he's doing a Latin saint. He's running around with an eye patch, mm -hmm. you know, and he's talking. He's talking about how, in um, he's the one-eyed man in, in in indigenous cultures. Yeah. That. Um, that sexual ambiguity and um, basically saying, you know, transvestism is kind of a, 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 a model for, you know, the, the person who's the shaman. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The, I, right, the, 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 so he brings that in and he's talking about this, right? Yeah. In early 1970s. Yes. And then he even, he even sources Camille Paglia. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Right, and she talks about it. So Bowie's interesting around fluidity. The thing that's fascinating about Bowie in terms of the context is that Bowie lived inside of a world of limitation. Mm -hmm. You look at the 1960s, although there was a lot of explosion, the world still had very definable limits, right? The world that exists now does not have the same kind of limits. Right. So doing the same kind of fluidity trip that Bowie did doesn't really mean anything in some ways because it wasn't like contrasted against 
you know, the, the, the Saturn cube in a lot of ways. Right. I got, I got what you're saying. And yeah. So, so now it's like, it's it, in a lot of ways, it's kind of, like, I, I don't want to say it's meaningless, but it certainly feels like mm -hmm. a type of nihilism that's been dressed up as some kind of socially yeah. progressive, you know, um, spiritual tech kind of yeah. humanism, right? But yeah. ultimately, it's a, still a form of nihilism. That's my, yeah. that's my take. Yeah, it is. Yeah, no, it's come up with a, in a number of conversations with people we've been having lately about this sort of androgynous spiritual space that we are talking about with, with, you know, a shaman, right? Like what, you know what I mean? Ind indigenous cultures and whatever. And that it's an inner thing. It's not this sort of like, you know what I mean? That's like right. it's, it's an inner thing. And this, this to me has always feels like a, they, how social, social engineering works, in my opinion, is to get people to focus on something outside of themselves. It's an externalization That's an externalization, yeah. right? And so that's the whole thing. Come to terms with your inner androgyny, have that spiritual growth on the inside, and have the experience in the, you know, the package that you came in. To me, just feels like, you know, a better thing to do. But, you know, this idea of just completely altering the outside of your body to me it's just i the whole thing feels very um it just it it it, it feels yucky to me and it feels lazy it feels lazy well, you know there's a that we talked earlier on in the, in the show centering on this identity thing robert you talked about it even in terms of the whole chiron thing that's in play and what we're really talking about here is outward identities versus the conflict resolution process that goes on the inner the inner process and i you know we're dangerously close to talking about some things here that emily and i've been talking about behind the scenes that are both personal and universal so in a sense what we're doing is we're taking what is supposed to be an inner transformative process we're externalizing the hell out of it and then then we're obliterating it it's like it's like the, the the white screen flame out where it just goes and everything just goes. Yeah. We flamed out on it, and we and there, missed, it, we missed what that process really was, which was the soul moving through this process of feeling. We we don't have feeling anymore. We have sensation that's externalized as Technicolor Hi-Fi, four G, five G you know, 4K pixel explosions rather than dealing with the nuances of our own inner structures. I hope that was somewhat. No, I, th I, th I think that that Very that's good, Randy. really yeah. well said. And, and, and the, the, the part that I think is really important to focus on is this flame out piece because, mm -hmm. you know, this place that we're in, which provides us with that opportunity that you're talking about, could be so altered that that opportunity could potentially go away, right? Yeah. And, and where are we then? And what are we here for? And what are we about? And there, and, and there are a lot of people that would say, well, man, you just got to adapt. You know, you got to adapt or you got to mutate or you got, you know, you got to get ahead of the curve and you got to let it all go and just go with it. Well, I'm not so sure that's really the answer it's, anyway. It's, it's mutate. Adaptation is something else. Actually, adaptation goes along with the process that Randy was describing. The inner, right? You, you, you have a feeling, you sort of adapt to that, you cope with it, you deal with it, you grow. Mutation is the thing that you're describing. I think mutation is the right word for what you're describing. You know what I mean? Like at this point, the thing that they may say adapt, but what it would really require to adapt to what they're talking about is mutation. And, the, and the, I, here's, here's where, again, I just want to go back to your point, Randy, because it was so um, articulately um, shared, is that there's also not any real spokespeople in the world for what you just articulated. Like, where are those people? You know, where are the people that actually have that insight mm -hmm. and can, you know, share with the world, say, hey, look, there's another model here. You know, there's kind of that religious side of it which sometimes gets, you know, creepy and weird um, and doesn't always stand up too well. But we don't have spokespeople that can get their face in the marketplace and say, hey, look, 
you know, there's something else going on here and you're missing a real opportunity if you just throw down $2,500 or you're cut it off, whatever it is, right? You're missing a huge opportunity. So, but there's, there's very little, I, I think, out there that actually supports what you're saying, which is kind of a shame. But the, no, actually, the, I'm in the process right now of doing some articles that I'm planning to put out to different good. organs that are going to address some of these issues. That's good. Because I, I think specifically the males in the culture now need to address this, both from the standpoint of being actively participating in the process and also taking the rightful role of being – I, it, men were supposed to be the ones who led the way. And somewhere along the line, they fell off the wagon and they've never climbed back on it. And this is not a screed against feminism or females. It's saying that you're not even on the wagon anymore, guys. You've, you've like abandoned it. It's like, it's like the celibates, you know, the guys that, are, you know, Incels. 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 They're, they're basically victims. They're, they're playing victim status on this whole thing. I'm sorry. There's lots of women in the world, and not all of them are angry feminists that aren't going to go down with you. Right. And the, <laughs> and, and, <laughs> but, but, but also, like, if you look at what they're looking for, you know, they're looking to get laid. They're not looking to have a relationship. Exactly. Right. exactly. Yeah. And they're not yeah. looking to have, you know, a, a commitment with another person. So they're, they're, and see, that's what it is. It's the sensate society that now that's right. instant gratification rather than the long term commitment to something that builds character, builds a relationship, and that frankly builds a society and a culture that's worth living in instead yeah. of this shit trash culture we're in right now. And I think, you know, I, th I think there are people who are kind of in some form of recovery. You know, they're older, you know, they're probably in their like, mid to late 40s, uh, up through their late 50s, who've gone through this kind of hyper stimulation that, that yep. we have. Like yep. when I was a kid, you know, sex was everywhere. It still is, but you know, it was a, we had our own version of titillation. And of course there was Playboy. And you know, the first thing is drilled into your head when you were a kid is, yeah, young male, it's like, hey, also I've had gotta have sex. You also had an imagination. Right, well, that's true. Now that's, that's been taken away. Now. Because I'm going to tell away. you, this is something I'm going to talk about more. Yeah, Porn has burned that out, too. Yes, I to totally agree. And so, but even in, you know, the, the we old days, right, when we had an imagination, we sold these magazines, but the idea was, hey, the best thing you could do is get laid, right? You know, you go, you go out with your friends at night, and, high, you know, when you're in high school, what, you know, what's at the top of your list? Well, every, you know, you got hormones kicking in and, Right. You know, and this program, you know, stays with people for a long time. And, you know, and sometimes, you know, we really fall in love or we have a deep connection with another person and we pursue it. But I think there are a lot of people in recovery from that kind of programming. And I think we're just starting to kind of sort these things out and what it means to, you know, have a body, share a body, be intimate, mm -hmm. you know, be vulnerable, be a man, be a woman. You know, I, I really feel like we're just kind of at, at this kind of proving ground in some ways because we're, because we're deprogramming everything, right? And that's part of it. And some people are better off with it. They have higher emotional IQ than others, and maybe they got it, and they got good parenting and whatever, you know. But I feel like this is kind of going on. I'm seeing people really try to understand where they're putting their energy now and not necessarily, you know, throwing it out there. I mean, this is a certain segment of society. Obviously there's another group that I'm not in touch right. with, but I, you know, but I'm, I'm, that's what I'm picking up on, but you're right. Porn has killed. Um, I mean, it's devastated. It's devastated the imagination of people's lives. Um, well, porn and just the sexualization of popular culture period has done that. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like the whole, um, you know, just, you know, swingers and sex parties and all this kind of stuff, right? This whole, it's become such a big thing that there is yeah. not, that somehow the magic of intimacy and romance and all that kind of stuff is just pfft, an imagination. You know what I mean? And, and, and just, um, and also just like enjoying time together, right? That stuff like, it's all gone. 
Did I mean it? That's this is a conversation that has been going on in the background of my whole world right now. It's awesome. Um, this hour is running down so rapidly. I want to make sure we cover what we wanted to do in this hour. Robert, is there anything else we got to bring in here to kind of resolve uh, the initial topic tonight, the Chiron Saturn thing? Chi Chiron, Chi Chiron Saturn, Chiron and Aries with Uranus. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, we're just into this right now. We're just yeah. we're just moving into this phase. And um, the one thing that I do want to share is that uh, in the chart of the United States, um, the United States has Chiron and Aries in its chart. So it's something that is really at the roots of the country because it's in the fourth house. So the United States will go through its Chiron return yet again. It's, it's been there before. And we're, we're really, it's not, it's not for a while. Um, but these are issues that are not going to go away. Um, they're going to be issues that we have to deal with. Um, and I think it could actually be a really dynamic and exciting time because we're actually having these discussions. And I think they really need to happen because, you know, there's a lot of healing that needs to take place between men and women in this world. Um, exactly. the, next thing, the next thing, you know, that we'll probably talk about on the other side of this is Uranus and Taurus, which is the counter, sort of the, the next phase. And it's a big phase. And we'll get into that. Cool. Okay. Emily, anything else we got to bring up? Uh, uh, no, Robert, just before we uh, move on over into the patrons hour, why don't you tell everybody where website. they can find you? Yeah. Oh, uh, I'm at robertphoenix.com. And uh, I do a daily podcast called 15 Minutes of Flame. And uh, just get into what's happening in terms of the events of the day and, and a little riffage. And then on Friday, I do the Friday forecast. And then on, on Sunday night, I do a live stream over on, on YouTube with astrology. And uh, that's where you can find me. And Robert Very gives cool. great readings. I know a lot of you guys have been availing yourselves of his services lately. I think that's awesome. Um, yeah. And also just guys, the other reason to watch Robert is that he is so fucking funny. <laughs> like literally, like, like, the, like I, I mean, I enjoy the whole thing, but like, Sometimes I'll be at work two or three hours or three days after you've said like the thing, the day with the cognitive dissonance thing, when you were like, this is what Robert said. He said, we're living in a time of cognitive dissonance. No, I'm going to call it cognitive dissonance. We're living <laughs> in cognitive dissonance. I literally like that night I was on my treadmill and you know, when you don't step right, you almost slide off the back. Right. I like bent over laughing because I thought of it again and I almost flew off the back of my treadmill right into like, you know, basically the baseboard of my bed. And sometimes I'll just be at work and I'll start laughing based on something you said this morning. He had this great little comment about how the fascists who call everyone else fascists were um, doing little pirouettes of digital glee online because, you know, the white van driver was a white guy and he hit white guys and whatever. But he just comes up with these little zingers that like, if you're having a total shit day, the zinger will save your day. So go over for a little comic relief from Robert as well. I think he yeah, has cool. a side career as the alternative media comedian uh, possibility going on there. And um, yeah. All right. If you think this hour was awesome, and it was, we're just warming up. You need to patron up. We'll be back again with another show if you're on YouTube. If you're not, if you're with us on Patreon, stand by. We're coming right back. See you there. Don't know, 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 don't know